Uh, Sandy received her undergraduate degree at the University of Florida and then earned her doctoral degree from the Florida State University, where she became and remains an avid Seminoles fan. Uh, she then joined the faculty of West Virginia University at Charleston and then moved to a current position at VCU in 1990. In addition to being a caring clinician, Sandy has actively participated in the research and service missions of VCU and has received numerous awards and recognitions. Anyone who knows Sandy, however, can tell you that her true passion is dogs. Human canine interactions have been the focus of much of her research and her service activities. Um, and she is the founder and director of the VCU Center for Human animal interaction, and she'll talk a little bit about some of the activities of that center today. So today she's going to talk to us about her research on evidence-based benefits of human-canine interaction. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you, Jenny, for that very kind introduction and also for inviting me to come and present. This is going to be difficult for me because I'm usually quite mobile. And I like to kind of play Oprah and get out there among you, but I've been told I need to stand here so that others can be able to see the slides and also to hear. So I'm going to try to plant myself behind what they usually call mother, I think, when they teach presentations. But it is a pleasure to be at RTI today and to talk about an area that I am so passionate about, as Jenny mentioned. Um, how many out there are dog owners? <laughs> Love it. How many have other pets besides, maybe not a dog, but other pets or have had a pet in the past? Okay, wonderful. Well, I hope when you leave here today, you'll have a little renewed appreciation for the wonderful relationship and the benefits that are mutual between you and your pets today. So what I wanted to do is provide you with an overview of my presentation, and I thought I'd start out by introducing you to our Center for Human-Animal Interaction in the School of Medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. Number one, it's very unique in that we are the only center of its kind in a medical school in the country. Um, and, but it also will show you at a very personal level the impact that therapy can, dogs can have on an individual. Then I will summarize some of the research that we've been doing at the center. Um, actually, some of this research dates before I became a part of Virginia Commonwealth University, but most of what I'll be talking about today has been the research conducted with my colleagues at the center. And then I want to talk about broadly what we're seeing in terms of the accumulating evidence. There are pockets of researchers from around the country, and I want to share with you where we're seeing that evidence growing with what populations and in what areas. So let me begin by showing you a brief nine-minute video of the Center for Human-Animal Interaction. And I need to bow out so that the wonderful tech people here can start this video so that you're hearing the video rather than static from me. So we'll let them do that.
ECU Health System plays a very special role for the citizens of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and frankly, all citizens in the Mid-Atlantic region. We are Central Virginia's only comprehensive academic health science center, uh, and as such, we provide state-of-the-art clinical care uh, across the full array of medical specialties. Uh, we provide state-of-the-art teaching opportunities for the full continuum of, of uh, medical and allied health professionals uh, and we are a research institution in that we provide uh, the output of cutting-edge research uh, to the nation and to the world. In that capacity uh, we have a number of other specialty programs as well, one of which is the Center for Human-Animal Interaction. The goal of the center is to discover uh, the, the full positive impact of having human-animal interaction being part of a clinical environment. At a patient care level, um, having the animals in the environment brings tremendous comfort to our patients. Uh, they bring, it brings a warmth, uh, a, a, a wonderful set of interactions to the clinical environment that I think clearly does have healing benefits to our patients. Nothing is more natural in the world than dogs and kids. They just go together like peanut butter and jelly. When we bring a dog into this environment, we don't have to explain to the kid what it's about. We don't have to say why the dog is here. We just say, we have a dog, do you want to see it? And they say yes. And then this environment becomes a place that where fun stuff happens and cool stuff happens. And when kids are feeling more calm about things and they feel like they have a master can master this experience rather than be the victim of it they are going to heal better when they're emotionally competent um, in this environment and feel like they have a role in what's going on they're going to heal better and the dogs accomplish that because it helps kids feel normal and like themselves when a lot of what goes on here makes them feel like this is not their life and how can this be happening to them dogs just make kids feel okay even when everything else is not okay. I'm the only person who walks in and doesn't want something from them. I'm not taking their temperature. I'm not asking them anything. If they want to play with the dog, they can. If they just want to sit and pat it, if they don't want to see it at all, that's okay with me. We're allowed into ICU. So we had a patient who progressed into ICU and um, we spent a lot of time with the patient and the family and, and when we actually lost that child, the family asked that Rocky sit with the family at the funeral services. And so you know that you've meant something to those people I and mean, you've been with them for months, day in and day out, in some of the hardest times of their life. And um, it's such an honor. The parents are just amazing. But um, as you can see, it really gets to me sometimes. We have found in our research here at VCU that patients' fear reduces after very brief interactions, maybe 15 minutes with a dog before a serious medical procedure. We found that our patients' anxiety levels reduce. Um, we know from other studies that uh, depression is reduced in patients. We've also found the benefit for our staff in that their stress hormone, cortisol, significantly reduces after only five minutes with a therapy dog. So we know that it's not just our patients that are benefiting but also our staff. So we're now looking at different things like brain waves to see what happens in the brain when people interact with their therapy dogs. And we're also starting to look at patients undergoing dialysis and to see what benefit they may have from interacting with dogs during that long process of undergoing dialysis. Oh, I love these guys. You need to come up here. Life gets to be a little hectic around here and people come in with various uh, serious psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, and we find that in addition to our standard treatments like medication and psychotherapy or talk therapy, something like AAT or animal assisted therapy is a very good auxiliary treatment. Uh, in the patient context, when we have someone who is depressed or anxious or even sometimes psychotic, that is, their reality testing is impaired. Uh, having 
uh, an animal visit them and having them kind of pet the dog, interact with the dog for a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, uh, comes in very useful, reduces stress levels, improves communication, improves behavior, helps the treatment team engage the patient better in treatment. In the ECT context, like electroconvulsive therapy, it is a procedure for serious depression and for a condition called catatonia. But, of course, waiting for ECT is an anxiety-provoking time. Um, and interacting with an animal rather than just waiting in the standard waiting room, reading magazines, we have found can reduce pre-procedure anxiety tremendously. There has been a study that demonstrated that at this medical center. I think it's great. Anything that makes patients feel better and more comfortable is a good thing. So I, I, I'm all for this. And I think they do a great job. These dogs are just great. They're well trained. They don't cause troubles. And the patients love them. So I think it's great. To walk through a very busy uh, cardiac surgery ICU, these are post op patients um, after heart surgery. And to see a precious soul who's been through an incredible event, the arms come out stretch. They don't even know what it's about. They just see the furry creature. Can they come? And to see how these dogs interact with the patients, it's, it's incredible to me. We've had patients sometimes who um, haven't responded to anything else. Um, and just having the dog and being able to stroke the dog, um, to see a smile come when you haven't seen one for several days, or to see a glint in a patient's eyes when you haven't seen that for several days is, is really pretty incredible. It's just, it's hard to relay in words the kind of effect you feel when you've seen a dog in action. You know you've made a difference. It might be small, but you see the difference in their faces. And you know that when that dog entered the room, they weren't asking anything of anyone. Here's a person who nurses me well, the doctors are there for them, they're trying to get better. The family's there for them, but they all want something out of this person. The dog comes in, it, it's visible, relaxation, it's visible, the difference that, that happens in just a few minutes. It's, um, you just stand back and watch it happen. It's something a person cannot do. A person cannot do it.
please bring him in. Well, there are a few things that they have to meet first, and one of those is that they have to complete the human end of the leash requirements, and that's going through our volunteer training through the VCU health system. And we only allow dogs who are adults only, and that's because what we're looking for are dogs that are predictable, reliable, and always under the owner's control. And you know those lab puppies don't quite meet that, and the golden puppies don't quite meet that. And they have to be registered with one of two external bodies as a registered therapy dog. We accept either Pet Partners, which was formerly Delta Society's Pet Partners program, or Therapy Dogs Incorporated. And once they've met that dog end of the lease, the human end of the lease, they're still not done yet because then they need to come in and become familiar with the health center policies and procedures. And being an acute care medical center, we have to ensure the safety of not just our patients and staff, but the dogs and the volunteers as well. So we have a manual and we do some shadowing to make sure that the volunteer owners are familiar with what goes on. And then we observe those dogs and the owners in the hospital environment several times to make sure, again, that they're um, meeting all those requirements, that the dog handler is comfortable, which is always the owner, and that the animal is still comfortable. Because, you know, hospitals are noisy places. We've got pagers, we have doors clanging, we have IB poles, we have kids shooting down the hall on a tricycle in pediatrics, so we need to make sure these are appropriate animals because we don't want to stress them out um, either. And as I mentioned, then they complete our own dogs on call orientation. So these dogs visit most areas of the VCU Medical Center, but there are a few areas that they don't visit. And they don't typically visit patients in isolation unless the physician approves it in writing in the patient's chart. They typically will not visit a patient with an active infe infection again, unless we have written approval from the physician. And occasionally, we do get that request from the physician because they'll weigh the, the uh, pros and cons, and they'll determine that the benefit of this dog visit for this patient outweighs any potential risk. So we don't go to the operating rooms. Um, we don't go to some emergency room areas, and that's just because they're so congestive. It's congested, it's not fair to the dogs. And unfortunately for the dogs, they can't go in the cafeteria, even though that's the place they would really like to go. So obviously, common sense things. We don't visit someone who's afraid of dogs. We don't um, visit someone who has allergies, canine allergies. Um, and every time, even though we may have a physician or a nurse or a chaplain, a social worker recommend a visit and request one, we always ask before entering that room whether the patient still would like a visit because sometimes their conditions change and they may not feel up to that. If we know someone has a history of violence towards a person or an animal, we're not going in there. Um, we do visit the secure care unit, which is our Department of Corrections unit, and again, this same um, applies. And for some of these inmates that are hospitalized, it is the only visitor they have had in years. And it happens with the dog in the hospital. It means a great deal to them. So, a bunch of dog owners out here. Do interactions with their dog benefit human health? What do you think? It's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? But we needed to get some data because the medical community in particular wants numbers. They want evidence. And so these are some of my co-investigators that I would like to acknowledge. Many of them at VCU, you see our research is very interdisciplinary. We also have had some colleagues from the Mayo Clinic, from Cornell, Hopkins, NIH also. And none of these individuals have been paid to do studies with us. These are all individuals who are interested in the human-animal interaction and want to be a part of this research. We operate primarily on donations, all of our center programs, and so these are individuals who believe and are interested and curious um, about the human-animal interaction. So the first research study we did was in the Department of Psychiatry because that's where my department home is, and I spent a few years after I came to VCU kind of proving myself in more traditional areas, trauma resolution in that area, because I didn't want them to think immediately we, when I came on board, uh-oh, what did we hire here? Um, at that time, back in 1990, the human-animal interaction wasn't really on the radar in medical schools, and so I found that the way to get a novel intervention into a conservative medical center is to say, I want to do a study. 
Research institution, you bet. So, okay, you want to do a study of uh, animal-assisted therapy. So I wanted to bring canines, therapy dogs, onto our acute psychiatric service and was able to do that. And what we found was anxiety levels of our hospitalized uh, patients reduced significantly after interacting with the therapy dogs for about 20 minutes. What we did was compared therapy, therapeutic recreation as usual with therapeutic recreation that consisted of a visit from a therapy dog and its owner and compared um, anxiety levels on those using the state trade anxiety inventory. So once um, we found this benefit, we were welcome on psychiatry, so it's kind of like off and running. So the next thing I wondered about, I'd read about how some dentist offices have fish tanks and that they say that that re relaxes people, and I thought, oh, hey, we could use fish tanks on the unit. So I'd like to do a study. And so that was okay as long as infection control said we had self-contained tanks. I guess they thought we'd go fishing. And so we had to have specially made 10-gallon tanks um, on that unit. And we compared patients before electroconvulsive therapy. Um, these are patients that's a very stress-producing, as you can imagine, waiting for ECT or electroshock therapy, as it's more commonly known. And so wanted to see if having the fish tanks in the waiting rooms for individuals would make a difference in their uh, fear, in their anxiety, and in their depression. And we really didn't find that. We found that the fish were popular with some of the patients. They even named the fish after the ECT staff, the red fish after the doctor who gave us the juice. And we found the staff really liked the fish tanks, and, but we really didn't find any significant findings. So I thought, okay, we didn't tell people to look at the tanks, to pay any attention to them. We just placed them in these rooms, and it would be easy to not pay any attention to them, particularly if you had family members visiting. And I thought, but you know, when that dog comes in the room, you can't really ignore a dog coming in the room. And actually, this picture is of one of my therapy dogs, H.I., who's now over the Rainbow Bridge, sadly. But H.I. was a presence there in the ECT suite, and he was often the last thing patients saw before they went under the anesthesia and the first thing they saw when they woke up. So I thought it'd be hard to ignore a dog coming in. Now, obviously, the study that we replicated here with the dogs didn't involve my dog because, of course, I'd be biased, duh. And so we used an unknown therapy dog coming in. And what we found was, amazingly, after 15 minutes with the therapy dog, the patient's fear significantly reduced and reduced by 37% after 15 minutes with a dog. And some of these patients are so anxious before ECT, they're actually shaking. So do we still have therapy dogs coming into psychiatry? You bet. And hopefully we'll always have them coming in. So one of the things that drives the research is what we observe clinically. And this, again, this was H.I. in his long hair before he got his championship and got a haircut. And the patients love to see that long hair and to pet him and make mats and things like that. But that was OK. It was very therapeutic, and it was wonderful for him as well. So I wondered when I would see, this is one of our anesthesiologists, and this was a candid shot, in between um, doing ECT with patients who was actually down on the floor interacting with HI. Now you're wondering, did he wash his hands afterwards? <laughs> yes, he did. We make sure of that. And so we wondered if the benefit was extending to our staff. We would see them, very busy professionals, and yet a dog would come on the unit and they'd immediately start baby talking for a few minutes to the dog, and they'd be on the floor and they'd be doing these selfies with the dog to send to their kids and their family. And so we wanted to know, would the, um, would they benefit, and are they benefiting physiologically? And we were fortunate that the IMS company um, funded this particular study because we looked at whether stress hormone levels in our healthcare professionals, one, are they sensitive to the effects of canine assisted therapy? And if they are, how do you know when to measure it? Nobody's done this type of research before. And so that was one of our uh, reasons for doing this study. And so we had 20 healthcare professionals who we looked at before and after 20 minutes of interacting with the therapy dog. Ten, uh, five minutes of interacting with the therapy dog and 20 minutes of quiet rest. And we measured their salivary and serum cortisol. And what we found was that after 45 minutes later, both had significantly reduced. Now the serum, if you're familiar with stress hormone, with cortisol, there's a lag with salivary cortisol 
um, catching up to the levels with serum. And we found that after 30 minutes, the serum cortisol had significantly reduced. And 45 minutes later, both of them had after as little as five minutes with the dog. And no difference, significant difference between the 20 minutes of quiet rest and either the five or the 15 minutes. Now, small study, so we can't say a lot about it, although our staff say a lot about it in that they really see a benefit themselves. They perceive a benefit. So then we wondered, okay, so if it's reducing stress physiologically in our healthcare professionals, our physicians, our nurses, what about our patients? And gee, if you're thinking about interacting with a strange therapy dog, would it be different if you're interacting with your own dog? So this was a physiological exploratory study we did, and we didn't have funding for it, so we had a small number of individuals come into our electrophysiology lab. We had 10 healthy dog owners that interacted with either their own or an unfamiliar therapy dog. And we measured salivary cortisol, salivary alpha amylase, quantitative EEG, blood pressure, heart rate, self-reported stress and anxiety. So they basically came into the electrophysiology lab. We hooked them up to the EEG, did some baseline for 30 minutes. We gave them a stress task on a computer. And then afterwards, we brought in for 30 minutes either their own or an unfamiliar dog. And then for 60 minutes afterwards, we kept monitoring them while they watched a neutral video so that they didn't fall asleep. That would mess up that EEG. <laughs> so these are the salivary cortisol results, which I think are very interesting in that you see the Stroop was the um, post, the Stroop was the computerized stress task. And so you'll see after the Stroop test that salivary cortisol level increased. And you can see one minute after having been with the dog for 30 minutes, you can see that decrease. The kind of bluish gray was the unfamiliar therapy dog they were with, and the magenta color or the FSU garnet color is the therapy dog owners um, with them. And you can see the consistent decline. Again, small numbers, we're just looking at patterns here. Systolic blood pressure results. Um, this was a little interesting in that, um, again, we saw a little bit of an increase with the Stroop. Didn't find that it was really that stressful for people. I think people are so used to computer games that computerized stress tasks may have lost their oomph. Um, but you can see with the dog, we took a measure the last one minute with the dog and the uh, systolic blood pressure was down. But look at that um, one minute post dog. You can see a little bump in the owner's the uh, dog owners, but you didn't really see that in the unfamiliar dog. And we wondered, hmm, I wonder what's going on there. And then the light bulb went out, well, duh, we just took their dog away from them by a strange research assistant. So you'd expect a little increase in that blood pressure. But again, similar um, results there. And then we looked at the brain waves, and here we did do some um, statistical analysis. And what you're seeing here is the comparison of the baseline to the post-stress task. And the low beta waves, increases in low beta activity is consistent with stress, and we certainly saw a consistent, uh, we saw a significant increase in that low beta activity following the stress task. Then if you look at the period from the stress task after the stress task to 15 minutes after the dog interaction, you see the two areas, um, theta waves and alpha waves, which are more consistent with relaxation, significant increase. So again, we're seeing that pattern of the therapy dogs and relaxation. And then when we did correlations between them, even more interesting in terms of the patterns, you can see that with the increase in theta activity, which is consistent with relaxation, we see a significant decrease in the systolic blood pressure and the uh, declining cortisol, which again is consistent. And then you can see the same thing with the increase in the theta. You see the uh, heart rate negatively, and you see the with the low beta, which is the activity consistent with increased stress, you see the significant correlation, a pretty strong one with the salivary cortisol. So again, expected, again, patterns of physiological um, behavior that are what we would expect with therapy dogs providing relaxation. 
So then we decided to look at our, I mean, we're like a kid in a candy store. We are so integrated throughout the VCU Medical Center, we can pretty much conduct studies on anything and anywhere we want if we had the funding and the interest. So a number of these studies are small just because we don't have the funding yet. And if you consider that a hint, that would be great. But um, so we decided to look on our pediatric unit. And because our dogs frequently visit peds and they're rated so highly there, we wanted to look to see if the canine assisted therapy would reduce self-reported pain and stress in our pediatric patients. And this was an interesting study and one I wanted to include because this was one where we did not find uh, positive findings uh, in terms of the stress and the pain. This was a randomized control study of 40 patients, again, rather small, but in an acute care medical center, it took us 12 months to get 40 kids consented because they're going to consults, they're going to operating rooms, they're being discharged, and then the, you go to get the consent and family's not there and all sorts of reasons why it's difficult to do studies with hospitalized children. But we did get our 40 um, subjects and we compared the canine assisted activity with building an age appropriate puzzle with a volunteer. We were trying to control for that therapy dog's owner being present as being what was causing some of these positive findings. And what we found is we, before and afterwards, we collected um, using numerical rating scales because the kids were familiar with this. The nurses would come in and ask them to rate their pain level from one to 10. So they're familiar with that system. So we use that to measure stress as well. We also wanted to look at attachment style because there's in some of the human animal interaction literature, there's some indication that attachment may have an effect on benefits of human animal interaction. And we also wanted to look at emotional closeness because in an earlier study that um, we did of dog owners, we found that owners were as emotionally close to their dogs as to their closest family member, which we thought was a little intriguing. And over a third of those, people were closer to their dogs and their spouses or their children. Now, I'm not going to comment on that, but we thought that was very interesting. So we didn't find any significant differences either within or between groups on the pain or stress, but we did see a flooring effect on both of these measures. We found very low levels of pain and stress. And so the good thing is VCU Medical Center is a good place to have your sick child because they weren't reporting, over half of them reported no pain level at pretest and no stress level. So that was good for the medical center, not so good for us trying to look at declines in these areas. What we did find, which we thought was interesting and worthy of further study, is that securely attached children reported significantly lower pre-pain and stress than kids who were not so securely attached. And this was attachment to their parents. Um, we also found that the dog-owning children were as emotionally close to their dogs as to their closest family member. We did not find this for cat or other or non-pet owners. So again, more indication. And it might be that when kids are hospitalized, they're perceiving that dog they have at home differently than they might normally. Again, this was uh, these were kids acute in an acute care hospital, and that's one riding her tricycle down the hall with the help of Riley, one of our therapy dogs. So the next thing that um, got our interest is we're seeing all of this interest in the media about dogs being brought into law schools and universities and all this media, public media attention saying, you know, they're reducing stress and it's wonderful and it's benefiting these kids, but there's no evidence. And so we decided, well, we would take a look at that, seeing as our university counseling services invited us to bring some of our therapy dogs during final exam week to student commons and to our medical center library. Our campuses, medical and academic, are separated by about a mile, although it's growing closer with these buildings that VCU is kind of absorbing and uh, we're kind of taking over Richmond, which is okay. Um, so we wanted to know, really, do these kids interacting, or young adults, I should say, interacting with dogs, does it really de-stress them? And so we agreed to bring our dog's owner, and we went through the IRB quickly and got a waiver because we didn't collect any identifying information. But one of the things we, we only had three weeks to, from the invitation to the event, so you know that drives you. 
And so we wondered, um, one of the questions we get a lot in the animal assisted therapy field is, is this a Caucasian therapy? I mean, people were saying, aren't African Americans afraid of dogs? It's like, where do you people get these ideas? And you know, wouldn't people from you know Asian countries be a, you know, not interested in this? Where do these come from? So we thought we are a very diverse university. We're going to take a look at this. And so we asked things like, what was their gender? What was their racial and ethnic background? And we also used that same stress visual analyze scale we've used in a number of studies quickly, so that the students could quickly. Um, indicate their stress levels before and after they interacted with the dogs. So I asked them, how many students do you usually expect, you know, expect at these types of things? Because they've done other events. And they said, well, usually we get 50 to 60 students come to these. So I thought, OK, good researcher, prepared double the amount of pre-test, post-test, came in there. We had 1,000 students. 1,000 students, so many so that the fire marshal <laughs> was rather having an anxiety episode himself because all these kids were wanting to come in and interact with the dogs. We also had the building people, the administrators, a little anxious because these kids were lined up on the balcony that was not meant to hold this many students. So all of a sudden, there's this massive coordination effort of having the students come in the back door, which is more secure, and then they left kind of individually through the front door over the balcony. And we were constantly having to go out and have the University Counseling Center make us more copies of our measures because we kept running out. Wonderful problem to have, wonderful evidence of how popular these dogs are on campus. So what's the answer to our question? And these are photos from that um, event with some of our therapy dogs. We um, had 823 students that completed pre and post. Some of them we missed because we weren't going to hold them up just because we ran out of forms. And so we would let them come in and interact and go out. But uh, when they came in, we had this ingenious system that actually our program coordinator came up with. We were thinking, how are we going to, without names, how are we going to match up these pre and post tests? You know, and all the research, you know, we're thinking, oh, gee, how are we going to sign it? Simple idea. Give them a post-it note and put a number on it and have them turn the post-it note, it'll stick to something when they leave. Brilliant, anonymous, matching it. It's a great idea, use it if you, you know, need to use it. So what we found is we had 74% female, which was not representative of the university. It was more females coming than um, is representative. We have about 50, 50 um, in terms of our male, female population. So one of the things we immediately saw was females were more attracted to this event. But when you look at the racial and ethnic diversity, there was no significant difference between the white and non-white attendants that came to this. If you look individually in some of those minority categories, you can see that we had more Asians than VCU student population. And this was compared with the incoming um, freshman population that we had these numbers. We had 10% African American when the university has 16% and we had 17 other racial ethnicities um, and VCU had 19%, but pretty close in terms of being able to say at least on our campus we did attract a diverse student body. And so did it really de-stress them? Well, first we found 68% of the students owned some type of pet and most of them that own pets own dogs, and 95% physically, whether they owned a dog or not, 95% of these kids physically interacted with one of the dogs. They didn't have to. There were circles around these dogs because there were so many students, so of course with the fire monitor and being concerned about the dogs, we were holding them off at the door and only letting you know so many in, but they didn't have to interact, and yet 95% physically touched at least one of these um, therapy dogs. And as you can see from Moose here, it's hard not to. Um, one of them, um, one of our golden retrievers spent almost the entire time on her back, letting people just <laughs> rub her stomach. And what we found was there was a significant pre-post difference in stress with 93% of these kids experiencing, whether they owned a dog or not, uh, perceived perception decrease in stress. So very interesting in terms of the uh, stress relief. We plan to follow this up this year. We have a little more lead time so that we can go through the IRB and get identifying information. But we're hoping to also collect some physiological data this time as well, looking at that stress. 
So which health benefits are we seeing supported by accumulating evidence? Now I'm going to go beyond what we're doing at the Center for Human Animal Interaction at VCU and we're engaged in a number of additional studies now. But looking at globally, where are we seeing that evidence accumulate? So if we look first at the physical health, um, we're seeing several studies, and these were large epidemiological studies done in Germany, done in Australia, done in the US, and what they found was, particularly with dog owners, that they make fewer doctor visits, and that's been equated with better health, and I'm not so sure. Um, all of us dog owners know what it costs to go to the vet these days, and I'm not so sure people aren't spending their money on veterinary care and aren't able to go to the doctor themselves. We don't really know. To me, that's a huge leap to say fewer doctor visits, but they're starting to hone in more, some of these studies, um, in finding that it's also associated with um, less use of medication. Again, that could be an economic factor, um, and self-reported ratings of well-being and global health. Some more controlled studies have looked at mortality after a cardiovascular event and found that um, mortality rates uh, are lower, significantly lower, for dog owners in particular. So again, appreciate those dogs that you have at home. They may be helping you in, in a number of cardiovascular ways, which is where we're seeing a number of accumulating studies. Um, one study uh, was done where it was a randomized clinical trial with a weightless control. Um, individuals, and these were borderline hypertensive stockbrokers. You'd expect them to be a little hypertensive. And they were, um, this was Karen Allen's study out of SUNY Buffalo, and they were randomly assigned to acquire a dog or a cat at the same time they started lisinopril, and they were monitored and found that over a six month period, and then again over a year period, uh, when they caught up with the weightless control, that while the lisinopril affected the diastolic blood pressure, it was the dogs that significantly reduced the systolic blood pressure, which of course is what's associated with stress reactivity. So I just wish I'd been in the audience at the American Heart Association when she presented that study. Um, but that's just one of several looking at improved cardiovascular function. We've also seen reduced physiological reactivity to stressful stimuli. Some of our studies have contributed to that, but others have as well. Although not all studies confirm, we have conflicted studies, um, but we are seeing accumulating evidence also that pet owners have increased physical activity. Now you think, well, yeah, dogs, you know, you walk dogs, but this was for cat owners too. And so not necessarily just dog owners. Reduced pain perception in some populations associated with um, animal-assisted therapy, and a recent study in Finland that looked at childhood illnesses and pets people owned in the first few months or the first year of childhood and then the later childhood illnesses they had. And it was interesting that they found the benefit of the reduced illnesses was only when households that had a pet that was inside less than six hours a day. So the pets had to go out getting all the mess and rub and stuff and bring germs in, apparently, to see the benefit on the reduced physical um, illness. I thought that was rather interesting. So then in the mental health benefits associated with human-animal interaction, we've contributed to a number of these. A recent meta-analysis of studies done looking at animal-assisted therapy and depression found that um, animal-assisted therapy and Pet ownership is associated with reduced depression, was their conclusion. A number of studies have looked at anxiety, including our studies, and found that um, human-animal interaction is associated with reduced anxiety. Most of these studies are done with dogs, but not all of them. Some have looked at cats. Some have included a variety of animals, particularly in classrooms. They'll use gerbils and some of the smaller animals. We've also seen reduced fear. Uh, such as our study before ECT. And a number of studies with the elderly have looked at loneliness, particularly elderly who are in assisted living facilities, nursing facilities, convalescing facilities, and found not just dogs, but also caged birds um, can reduce anxiety in this population. 
increased pro-social behavior. These studies have primarily been done with not only adolescents who were experiencing difficulties, whether it was psychiatric or developmental, and finding that interacting with or having a dog present actually increased the interaction with not only other patients or other residents in the facility, but also the staff as well, as well as, of course, talking to the, to the animals. And increased social support, in fact, one of our foundation theories about the benefits of canine-assisted therapy is that the dogs provide a form of non-judgmental social support for individuals. All of you dog owners know they don't care if you're clean. In fact, the dirtier the better. They don't like clean clothes. They like dirty clothes. Um, and so you know that the whole non-judgmental acceptance that that they provide. And when people ask us, what, what's the magic that occurs in the hospital? What, why are they making such a difference with your patients? They don't ask anything. You know, and think about touch in a hospital. You've got nurses, physicians touching, but it's a purposeful touch. I'm trying to get your blood pressure. I'm trying to get your heart rate. I'm trying to listen. Um, but the dogs come in and it's, oh, they can just hug the dog if they want to. Um, kids who are sick, sometimes people come on the floor and they're wondering, what, the kid's on the floor playing with a dog? I thought they were, could, wouldn't get out of their bed. So a number of things that you see with just that whole human-canine uh, relationship that develops. And then several studies have found increased empathy in children who are raised with dogs. <clears throat> Excuse me, in children who are raised with dogs. So those are the areas where we're seeing primarily the um, both physical benefits and the health benefits of interacting with companion animals. We're involved in um, several studies currently at um, VCU, and one of those is a follow-up to our Pets in the Workplace study. Now, this was a preliminary study that we gained entry to. Many, any of you heard of replacements down the road in Greensboro? If you break China or Crystal or something, well, they allow their employees, and again, China Crystal, to bring dogs and cats into their facility. And on any given day at replacements, there are 30 dogs in that facility. And so when you see someone who is repairing a piece of your prized crystal and there next to her is a chihuahua in a dog bed, it's pretty amazing. They allowed us to come in and um, do a study in their workplace, as long as, of course, we didn't interfere with productivity. So in that study, we assigned pagers to the employees and we paged them. This was just the day shift four times a day and asked them to rate their stress level. We also had them complete um, job satisfaction um, survey looking at organizational commitment, uh, pay, rating things like pay and benefits and things like that. And we had three different groups. We had a group who brought their dogs to work over the course of this week-long study. We had a group who had dogs but left them at home, and then we had a group of non-pet owners. And what we found is for the group as a whole, whether they were pet owner or not, their ratings on their job satisfaction and those subscales were significantly higher than industry norms throughout, basically, whether it was pay, whether it was benefits you might expect because of the dogs, but communication, um, those things that, that they rated. They also, on their stress, rating their stress throughout the day, the dog owners who brought their dogs to work started out pretty low and remained low, even went down throughout the day. The owners who had their dogs and left them at home, their stress level significantly increased as the day went on and was significantly different from those who had their dogs there. The non-pet owners, their stress went up, but it was kind of in the middle of those two. And we had the dog owners who brought their dogs to work, bring them on two days during the week and leave them at home two days. And on the two days they left the dogs at home, their pattern mirrored the others who didn't bring their dogs and that their stress level went up through the day. Now, we don't know why. Um, it might be wondering what the dog's up to at home. It might be, gee, I need to get home to let him out because it's been there a long time. We don't know why, but it was very interesting. Preliminary study not randomized, it went viral in the media all over the globe and still we're getting the Washingtonian two weeks ago called for an interview. Charlie Rose thought this was fascinating, so he brought his dog to work on the day they reported this study, came down, sent a crew down, did an interview, Australia, Hungary, France, BBC, preliminary study, but it just hit a chord with people. So we're doing a follow-up of that study now we're looking at actually 
a lot of different organizations were identified through these media outlets who were reporting on the story of workplaces that allow pets in the workplace. So we're doing a follow-up study now trying to find out what policies, if any, are in place in these organizations, what are the positives, what are the negatives, and so hopefully we'll be reporting on that soon. The other thing we're up to is um, we tagged on to a National Institute for Drug Abuse uh, study that is called Spit for Science. Now this is aimed for college students, so you can understand why the title Spit for Science, because we're getting DNA from this huge cohort of students coming in over a three-year period. They're completing large surveys focusing on mental health and substance abuse outcomes. What we did, we were able to get some questions in there about pet ownership in childhood and attachment to a pet. So what we're trying to look at, including looking at DNA, is does having a pet in childhood somehow provide a protective factor for the substance abuse and mental health outcomes? So we're really excited about that study too. And then of course, doing the stress level. Now I say that because our staff consists of part of my time, a 15 hour a week paid program coordinator and a center intern, and that's it. The rest is volunteers and other people who believe in what we do and we welcome volunteers. So with that, I thank you and would love to open it for questions and any discussion that you may have. And we have microphones in the back so that if you have a question so that the folks at the other facilities can hear you. We have a question over here. Put in any of your studies any kind of component to see how this affects the well-being of the dog? That's a very good question, and we haven't at this point because we don't have a veterinarian involved. Hint, hint. Um, where's that Canine Health Foundation group? Um, we don't have a veterinarian involved. Um, we, in our policies, we are very, very careful about the safety of the dogs. We make sure that they are not visiting on a unit more than an hour. Two hours is maximum to be in the facility. They take the dogs outside. We have areas for the dogs to rest and exercise, but we are very, very cognizant of that and would love to do a, a study of that. We kind of can judge by um, their behavior, the tails wagging. Um, HI, my therapy dog, and that was for Champion Barker's high anxiety. He went to pediatrics, so high anxiety fit him. Um, <clears throat> My whole day when I had him with me would be structured around having this dog there. I would not have, you know, many meetings, and if they were, there were meetings he could come to and sleep. I would have him on the inpatient psych unit for an hour because it's a very intense unit. Then he would come back. We would go outside to the grassy area. He would play. We'd go to my office. He'd get treats. He would sleep. And I might have one or two outpatients scheduled in the afternoon, and I would leave early, and that was it. And he was exhausted by the end of the day. But when he was visiting on the inpatient unit, he would let me know when he needed to leave. He would just head for the door. And I'd see him on the leash, and I would just tell the patient or whoever, I'm sorry, he needs a grass break, and people would get that. Um, but most of the owners, we train them to be very cognizant of those dogs, and they love their dogs and are really good about doing that. We also have to be careful as dogs age because they become less tolerant sometimes of, of this type of activity. And so we require that they be re-registered, recertified every two years just to make sure. And we also are observing them as well periodically to make sure. But it's, it's a very important question and one that we would love to research. We just don't have that arm yet. Maybe after today we will then. The question over here. Yeah, um, I had a question. I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation, and um, I, I uh, love my dog very much. So um, I, I wish that he could have been here today to see it. So um, he, he would have really enjoyed it, and I'm sure it would have decreased his stress if he would have been here with me. So to follow up on the question about um, the animal care, um, in, it, I was wondering, do you have to get um, uh, institutional animal care and use approval for doing this kind of research. It, it, just curious, 
And then I also wanted to say that I, I think that if there was a way to be measuring, you know, making a measurement in the dogs as well as in the humans, you would probably find that the dogs that are with their owners and participating in these kind of activities would really be enjoying it. And you would see the same kind of decreased in stress and anxiety than dogs left at home, like my dog that has to be at home today. And, uh, and so, you know, so I'm hinting to RTI, right? So, um, so I think that it would be, you know, something that would be really interest maybe in veterinary medicine, you know, as well as in human uh, medicine. Um, and, and I'm sure the veterinarian here will want to follow up on this later. But anyway, I'll let you say something about that. Yeah. Well, well, and your veterinarian who's there with you may, may know that they've done some studies with cortisol in dogs, but the problem is when they've found increased cortisol, they're not sure what that means in a dog. Does that mean they're excited and happy to be there, or does that mean they're stressed? Um, so I think we need, the, the last I heard some people talking, it was more looking at the more behavioral ways to assess, which I think um, make a lot of sense. But we are certainly, we are interdisciplinary, as you saw from our list. We are open to collaborating with, with people, and that would be really important to, um, to look at. You asked a question before that, a first. Oh, IACOC. Yes, we love IACOC because they give us a waiver. We are not researching the dogs. Now, if we do what you're saying and start researching the dogs, then we will need IACOC approval. But so far, the dogs are doing what they normally do in the facility, so they're not being studied. So we have not had to get IACOC approval yet. I just have a comment. First of all, I enjoyed your presentation. And just by coincidence, it happens, I'm from Durham, and I subscribe to the Durham Herald Sun newspaper. The supplement to that in the magazine section, there was an article regarding the same human-animal interaction. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful, and they may have, a lot of times they'll tag on to studies, and the Washingtonian just came out a couple of days ago where they um, had done, you know, it's always amazing, a reporter spends 30 minutes and then you see what they print and you think, why did they pick that? But anyway, and they were talking about the study we had done on pets in the workplace, so it may have been related to that. That, like I said, it just keeps going and going and going. You know, I think of everything mechanistic related, and I, is this doing something that an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety drug is the thought of looking to see if people were on medication, would this enhance or would it just be the same uh, type of benefit? And that hasn't been done to my knowledge where they've actually or that we've looked at the anti-anxiety medication and whether it's enhancing or not. It just the question just hasn't been answered. It'd be a very fascinating study to do. When we did our physiological study, we screened out people that were on anti any um, psychiatric medications. We also screened out people who were on um, hormonal therapy because of the cortisol we were assessing. So we had a physician screen them to be healthy, whatever that means, healthy, but that um, they weren't on any medications that would affect what we were measuring. But that would be an interesting study to look at. When we looked at the kids, we, we did, um, the pediatric population, we did collect medication, but it was all over the place, the medications they were taking. And we really couldn't, other than reporting that they were um, other than, and then that study's in press right now, other than reporting that they were on all these medications and that we had this flooring effect, we really couldn't make any sense of it. And most of them were on um, anti-inflammatories. It wasn't that they were, you know, on any, you know, narcotics, but uh, they were on a lot of NSAIDs particularly. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I had a question about one of the studies you talked about. In the beginning, you said that these studies have been done since 1990. And since my partner is a cat, and you had mentioned that dog owners seem to be more attached than cat owners, 
I was wondering what year that study has been done since there has been a drastic change in the past 25 years in our attitudes. And that study actually was published in 1988. The original one we did with people as close to their, their pet dogs. Um, it has not been, um, we know that people are very attached to their cats, to their horses, to their um, guinea pigs. I mean, in the attachment forms in our first study with dogs, we know it didn't matter how old the dog was, how long they had it, that attachment, boom, was there. But it certainly needs to be, we need more studies in this area. It's a you know, fairly new field of inquiry, and it certainly would need to be updated. Majority of the pets to cats. Mm -hmm. It was right about that time when that switch took place. But cats are a different animal. I mean, definitely a different species. I grew up with cats, and I used to ride my bike with the Siamese draped around my neck. Um, and yes, he would attack repair people who came to the door if he didn't like their looks. There was just something about him that was uh, very protective. But, and, and you know that, you know, they're different species, but whether our attachment is different is a certainly different, you know, question. And people talk about cats being perfect for the generation that travels and has gone a lot because they can take care of themselves pretty much, leaving some food in a litter box. So, um, don't know, needs to be updated. Good question. Hi, I had two two part question from here. Yes, thank you. first I want to know if that is really your last name because that was the first thing that I noticed when I saw. And I get that question, and I married into that name, but a long time ago. Isn't so yes, funny? it is. It's so ironic. In funny. fact, I had somebody review our paper who said this must be a made up name. <laughs> Kind of a review. It was a European review, or not somebody here, of course. So, and my second question is: Are um, are you familiar with, or have any interaction with the the um, Duke Canine Cognition Center, and Dr. Brian Hare, and you know some of the work that they're doing? Is there a possibility for you know some work to, working together? Actually, we've had one discussion, and we talked about possible collaboration. There wasn't, didn't seem to be quite the fit at that point. But we're aware of the wonderful work they're doing. They're aware of our we work, and so. Hopefully, at some point, we'll we'll have a you know some type of collaboration. I had a question about your initial studies, and in that I wondered. I was thinking about the personality traits of someone who has a therapy dog, who's done all the training, done all the certification, and I wondered if you perhaps if your study incorporated the visit by the uh, dog owner but not the dog itself, to see if there was something about that person that also affected the stress. We did not have the owner present when we did this study with the, the familiar dog, the unfamiliar dog. The owner was not present, so it was just the dog because we were concerned about that. But on the other hand, animal assisted therapy doesn't take place without the human end of that leash. And so it's nice from a component analysis to try to look at where it's coming from, but the owner is always going to be there. It wouldn't be ethical for us to take a dog away from its owner and put it in a room with a strange person and, you know, expect something so. I just thought it might be interesting to look at the impact of the owner of the dog making a separate visit. And, and we haven't done that. And there's been one study done with the owner without the dog visiting. Um, and I'd have to go back and look at that study. I don't recall that the just visiting from the owner made a difference. But in our study with the children, completing a puzzle with the um, research assistant, there was no significant difference between that and the visit by the dog. But again, we had such floor levels of the stress and pain that we really couldn't say. I have to add that that study we also included um, measuring heart rate variability. And I was complaining about this earlier to some folks I was meeting with. And be careful when you buy equipment and the salesman says, oh, yeah, it'll do that. What we found was after we spent all this time and collected all that heart rate variability data that we could not get what we wanted, it was only for measuring 24-hour um, heart rate. And not only that, you couldn't get the raw data because it doesn't produce it. It only produces it through this software that was of no use to us. I won't mention the company, even though I'd be tempted to, but it was extremely frustrating for us. So some of this research has been real challenging, as all research is. Yeah. Murphy's Law. Funding, I know you mentioned several times that um, 
a lot of this was small studies and, you know, you're looking for funding. Like we always are constantly looking for funding as researchers, mm -hmm. but so who, who do you get funding for this from? Like, is, are, do you have a lot of federal clients? Is it state or, or, or sort of, and then a, a sort of a follow-up is what do you think can be done to try and increase awareness and increase funding in this research area? It, it's a real challenge to most of our funding is unfunded. Most of these studies are unfunded, which is why they're small, because we can't afford, when you're dealing with the physiological pieces, we receive donations from individuals who believe in what we're doing, and so when they send us a donation and it's restricted for research, of course it's in our restricted account and we'll use some of that. Um, we've had several individuals to give us some funds that allow us to do some of these small studies. We received um, some funding from IMES um, Research and Development, but this was years ago, and then when Procter & Gamble bought them out, their focus changed to being solely nutrition focused, and so we weren't able to get that funding. So it is a challenge. It's indeed a challenge. So most of ours are necessarily small. We still do it because we are fascinated by it and we're interested and we get some really good collaboration from others. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Wish I had a better answer. We'll go ahead and wrap up now. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, Monica asked that I ask you to fill out the evaluations and put them in the box in the foyer, if you would. Thank you. <laughs>